Hey everybody, it's Jay here. Uh, today I'm probably making the most rehearsed and researched video that I've ever made. I'm probably putting more effort into this video than any of my other videos before. Today I'm going to be talking about trans identity and mental illness. And how in the past being trans has been treated like a mental illness. How it's still currently treated like a mental illness in most places. And how that has affected the trans community and what we can do instead that still gives trans individuals access to the transitional needs that they have. So, without further ado, let's begin. So in 1980, gender identity disorder was added to the DSM-3, which is the Diagnostics and Statistics Manual. It's basically like a database of mental health problems that an individual may or may not have, and mental health professionals use it to help diagnose different mental health issues. So, this occurred six years after they removed homosexuality from the DSM-2 in 1974. A lot of people think that the reason they added gender identity in is in an effort to discourage people breaking gender roles and discourage LGBT individuals from coming out and living their lives as their true selves. It was another effort to discriminate against the LGBT community. Within the last five to ten years, people have stopped saying gender identity disorder and swapped over to calling it gender dysphoria. This is because a lot of people expressed discomfort with the fact that it was explicitly being called a disorder and a lot of trans individuals were already using the term gender dysphoria to explain and define feelings of negativity that they had about their bodies and about themselves in relation to their gender. The symptoms for children differ from the symptoms for teenagers and adults because of the fact that the children's symptoms focus more on the actions of the child rather than how the child may actually verbalise their feelings. Obviously, adults are better able to verbalise their emotions and process their emotions, whereas children are not necessarily at that level yet. So, the children's symptoms largely focus on actions that break gender roles, such as playing with toys not typical of their assigned gender, playing with people of the opposite gender, insisting on engaging in activities such as sports or games that would be typical of the opposite gender rather than their assigned gender. It also includes kids who persistently, consistently and insistently state that they are not their assigned gender, that they are the opposite gender. It also includes stuff about kids who insist that their genitalia are going to change or that they want their genitalia to change. And lastly, it also includes kids expressing discomfort at the onset of puberty. Teenager symptoms and adult symptoms are different. It involves explicitly stating that you feel like your gender identity is at odds with your assigned gender, stuff about feeling more comfortable in the gender role of the opposite gender and in general wanting your wanting to hide parts of your body that may give away your assigned gender and wanting your genitalia to change. The treatment for gender dysphoria now is all about a supplying form of therapy for an individual, supplying gender realignment surgeries for an individual, rather than trying to force the individual to accept their assigned gender. In the past, conversion therapies were used to try and convince someone to just accept their assigned gender, but those efforts proved to be useless. It didn't work. People didn't suddenly start to accept their assigned gender. The only thing that actually relieved the symptoms of gender dysphoria was allowing an individual to transition. There's a lot of problems that come with the idea of treating transness as a mental illness, specifically along with the symptoms. The symptoms are a massive problem because they arise on binary identities. They explicitly talk about the opposite gender, opposite gender roles. It talks so much about the opposite gender that for people who don't identify explicitly as the opposite gender, they're often denied transitional needs that they want and that they know they need, but in the eyes of this mental health professional, because they're not the opposite gender, they don't need them. It's also a big problem with these symptoms because they so frequently talk about gender roles, despite the fact that a cisgender individual can break gender roles in the same way as a trans person could. There's no need to label anyone who breaks gender roles as trans, because you can break gender roles without identifying as trans. It also means that trans people are not allowed to break the gender roles, because if you identify as the opposite gender, you're not allowed to indulge any gender roles of your assigned gender. So it leads, it leads to cis people being labelled as trans when they're not, and trans people being labelled as cis when they're not. The overwhelming problem that a lot of people have with labelling trans identity as mental illness is it gives this distrust of trans people to self-identify their gender. <laughs> a lot of trans individuals will say that before they went to go get diagnosed with gender dysphoria, they already knew their identity, they knew how they identified, and they didn't need somebody else to verify that or tell them. They only went because they had to do it 
to get access to transitional care. The problem with that is that trans individuals don't need their identity verified. They know their own identity. And there's this distrust in making somebody get diagnosed as trans effectively that infers that you don't trust them to make their own decisions about their life. The alternative system to getting diagnosed with gender dysphoria and then getting treated for gender dysphoria is the, the concept of self-declaration and informed consent. consent. Self-declaration is when you basically just say, I am a man and people accept that. Say, I am a woman and people accept that. Say, I am a binary and people accept that. Nobody attempts to verify your gender to prove that you are the gender you say you are. It's all about you stating your gender and that's what's important. Informed consent is when you are given a, a booklet of information, you're given the freedom to ask your doctor any questions that you want about whatever procedure it is you want to go through, be it hormone replacement therapy, be it uh, top surgery, be it bottom surgery, and once you've gotten yourself informed, you can just sign off and consent to it. It means that nobody else has to verify that you are allowed to have this surgery. Lastly, I want to talk about gender euphoria. It's basically the opposite concept of gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria is all about having discomfort with things in relation to your assigned gender, whereas gender euphoria focuses on the happiness that you may feel when you finally get to live your life as your true gender. For me, that would be passing as male and feeling really good about it. That's gender euphoria. Versus passing as female and being really sad about it. It's all about focusing on the positive aspects of becoming who you are and living out your trans identity versus the negative aspects of being trans. And I think it's important that more people start to learn and think about gender euphoria rather than defining who they are based on negative negativity, when you can define who you are based on positivity. That video was so much research and so much rehearsing and so much effort, but I'm glad I made it. I really enjoyed making that video and I hope everyone enjoyed watching it. The like button is down here if you want to see more videos like this. The subscribe button is over there if you're not already subscribed to my channel. Please do. <laughs> and the comment box is open for any of your ideas or opinions about anything I've discussed in this video. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.